Hey friends. I just had a wonderful piano lesson uh, with my incredible teacher, Madeline, and so I've kind of got brand new thoughts ricocheting around in my brain. They're not all, they may not come out in fully formed paragraphs is what I'm saying. But one of the things we talked about which is something that, you know, it applies to music in a kind of very direct way. And it also, of course, applies to life in any number of ways. But is this idea of the forest and the trees. And in music, you know, if I'm playing something like today, I was working on this Chopin Edu, which is nowhere near being ready to perform, but it's this, it's number five. Et cetera, et cetera. It's called the Black Key A2. And she had me paying attention to, I, I kind of played it a little bit like I played it just now, kind of like bullet like. The notes come out a little bit like a machine gun. Pop, people, people, beep, pop, people, people, beep, pop, people, people, beep, pop, people, people, beep. And it's a little kind of, it just sounds stressed out. And so what she was kind of having me do was standing up and moving the piece. Just getting my body to feel that. So I'm kind of, I have a, have a kind of a dance to the piece, to the music, to the movement, to the overall flow. And that diminishes the kind of about the equal privileging of every note a bit. Super helpful stuff. And, it, you know, and as soon as I then, what I also find is that if I'm doing that on a, if I do a little bit of that work on a classical piece, all of a sudden, as I get into something more like jazz-like, It's like I've gotten accustomed to the idea that there's an impulse and then a, and then a kind of a, a, like a wave actually has a contour. A wave isn't like a digital wave where it's just like a square bite of information. It's a, it's a grows and it dies and it grows again and it dies. And that's, there's a kind of, that's, that's like the life, the breath of music that's coming through and you can't feel that when I'm when I'm thinking about okay what are these what are all these notes oh my god all these black keys right it sounds like that it sounds like I'm thinking about and that's those are indeed the notes but that's not the gesture that's not the breath that's not the phrase. I'm not doing it perfectly, but there's a there's a there's a massive shift there that really really it, it, you know it's, it's not I wouldn't say it's new information to me, but every time that I kind of connect with that and recall that, it gives me a burst of inspiration. I just get excited. Because it's like, oh, right. And the other thing that I noticed is that, you know, and Madeline kind of confirmed, affirmed this. When I'm doing that, when I'm feeling that, the music gets easier to play. I don't have to work so hard. It's actually easy. You know, and, and I was like, yeah, because it, you know, it kind of organizes the technique around certain 
focal points, and 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 it and that completely changes the nature of the technique. It it changes the nature of, you know, it's like if you didn't know if you're swinging a tennis racket, right? You're swinging a tennis racket. It's like if you didn't know what portion of your stroke was back backstroke, what portion of your stroke is the the loop around and the accel the, the beginning of the acceleration forward of the racket. What portion of your stroke is the, is the is the connection point, the place where you're going to hit the ball, and what portion of your stroke is follow through, right? Each of those parts of the stroke just becomes an intuitive part of a of a movement that has that has a a kind of spectrum, an elastic distribution of tension and release throughout the movement. If you didn't know. The, what each parts of those strokes were, if, you, or if it wasn't just ingrained as something we practiced, where you need to apply force, where we need to be applying force away from the movement. You know, we're pulling, the first thing we do is pull the racket back away in the, in the direction that we don't want the ball to go. Why? Well, because we need a backstroke, because otherwise we don't have any power. If we, if we didn't understand how the stroke works and we just maintained equal stiffness through the entire stroke, it would be the least effective tennis stroke ever, and you'd never hit a ball right, and you'd quit tennis. <laughs> and that's kind of what piano, it's, it's actually remarkably similar. If you don't know what's, what's backstroke, where, back, where to back off, where to, where's the real, where are you hitting, where are we landing, where are the kind of emphasis points, then you want to quit piano, right? It's no fun to play that way. So this was just a really kind of a really great, um, really great lesson and a really nice reminder of that. And, and the thing she emphasized, which I, I, it's like, I know this and yet I sort of still need someone to tell me, to remind me to do it is you got to get right up into the forest or get right up into the trees and then step back and see the forest. And she gave a beautiful analogy of an artist, you know, like, let's say like one of these artists who's painting a huge canvas, you know, the canvas might be 10 feet by 12 feet. Well, artists are just the size of normal humans. They have to stand there and look at one little part of the painting in order to paint it, you know, unless we're talking about like Jackson Pollock throwing paint everywhere. But I'm saying, you know, you're you're painting a little portion of the picture. Well, you've got to go and stand back and see what you've done and how it fits in. But then in order to do the work, you've got to go right back up close and fix details. And, you know, so so it, there's an inherent forest and of the trees, forest and of the trees, forest and it constantly moving in order to do the work. Same thing, right? There's no real way. There's no perfect distance from which to stand away from a Chopin etude or any other piece of music as though like that's the real piece. Like this is the distance at which we need to be observing it. No, every little micro movement matters. How my hands touch those keys. I can't play that without knowing really precisely, and I do some eyes closed practice sometimes. See where I miss, you know, see what, what, what parts of the phrase my hand doesn't actually know. My eyes, it's kind of relying on my eyes to tell it. But, but if I stay there, then I'm gonna be, then my, then my view of the whole is gonna be restricted. So, you know, this is just, me kind of riffing on my most recent uh, instruction and a really helpful one, but I think it's it's you know doesn't, not too hard to apply this to life, right? Not too hard to kind of transpose this to a problem we might be facing in life, where it requires both 
a nitty gritty granular level kind of attention, micro focus, and also a relationship of some distance, you know, like working with my working with Annalise on music on violin, as I've talked about a number of times over the past couple of weeks, I have to do both. I have to be right there for her, for what's happening right now in this very moment, whatever tiny little thing we're looking at. But then I've also got to consistently, and I sometimes need a reminder about this, step back, listen, feel the overall temperature and timbre of the, of the room. What effect am I having on her experience? You know, there's a kind of like, way back seeing the forest portion of the work that's also it's equally important it's not like one's more important than the other you gotta it's gotta be both it's it's because ultimately it's not not about any of those levels it's about everything it's about the whole thing so it's really fun to recognize that i, mean, I think i'm i'm affirming it and i'm artic i'm sort of articulating it for myself because maybe I'll remember it. <laughs> maybe I can actually bring the, you know, this is something that I've noticed in my lessons with Madeline, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get on the lesson and I'll play a certain way. I'll do, you know, play what I'm working on. And then she'll say something she's said a hundred times and it completely changes my playing. All of a sudden I'm in a totally different space and I, and I'm listening in a new way and I'm feeling in a new way. And I'm always like, well, thank you. This is amazing. And you've said this before. How can I bring my own awareness of this more into engagement, you know, without needing a, a, a wise and patient teacher <laughs> to just give me the note again for the hundredth time and little by little it sticks. I mean, again, this is why we have relationships with great teachers and great coaches this is what this is what these folks we folks do is kind of <clears throat> try to be that influence that brings us ultimately closer to ourselves back into our own s sense of things um and just remind and give us that reminder you know that gentle reminder <clears throat> but i am trying to kind of integrate this and see if i can come to my own practice session and imagine what my teacher would say so that I can make my own process even more effective. That's what I got today, people. Piano-centric post, but what else do you expect on a Monday afternoon after my lesson? Thanks, people. Thanks for watching. Appreciate you. Have a wonderful day. I will see you very soon.